and I wanted to bring this um, technology down under, so to speak, um, because I think that the benefit for a subset of patients is very significant. After a lot of intense discussion and uh, convincing, um, they came on board and have been very, very supportive actually of, of this for benign nodules so far. And we're wanting to, you know, I'm wanting to now expand that to micro cancers as well. So that's the uh, the next avenue. And you know, my initial plan actually went as soon as I almost landed in quarantine. I was reaching out to some of the hospitals and saying, look, you know, I'd at least like to find, because at that stage we thought we would probably go back to the US. So I was like, you know, I'd find some people and train them and proctor them and get them going. And so I was already kind of looking at that. And then, um, but it was, you know, in a way easier once we decided, did decide to stay, it was very easy because it was just me then um, doing it. And there was, you know, and now um, obviously we want to sort of proctor some people in other states and things to get going. I've had numerous patients come to see me, not, um, I've, I've had a number of patients who haven't been suitable for the procedure, unfortunately, because their um, nodules have not been benign, or I've thought that there was too much compression of the trachea, or it was too far, but too far down into the chest. Um, but, um, and I've had a lot of um, people from interstate um, who we do telehealth visits you know, after intense review of, of many medical records and ultrasound images. Um, so I've seen a lot of people because of the COVID restrictions here and the border lockdowns, um, I've got a very long waiting list of patients uh, in New South Wales, which is the state immediately north of, um, of Victoria. Um, and so I'm actually looking at maybe starting up a program up there myself, just going up once every month or every couple of months to do a list because it's um, there's so many people up there that want it. It's patients educating physicians about the technology is what's happening. And it's the wow. same in the US. And I knew it would be like that. And this is basically what I told the hospital, you need to get some sort of marketing out very quickly. And we did, um, our first patient very kindly agreed to be interviewed by one of the news channels here. Um, and, um, and that allowed people to say, wow, this is here because most, well not most, but a lot of the patients that I've seen knew about radiofrequency or knew about thermal ablation and they were just waiting. Some of them have even been to Italy and to Korea and had previous treatments, but they were just waiting for it to come here. And so this is the same as in the US. It's very much driven by the people who have the nodules. Um, it's not driven initially by the healthcare providers because to be honest, um, most of the physicians in Australia at the current time have no idea about thermal ablation, which is, um, which is sad, but they, you know, they're gradually becoming more aware of it. You know, I've had a number of endocrinologists advise patients against it, thinking that it was basically um, radio iodine ablation that the patient was talking about, because unfortunately that word radio at the beginning of radiofrequency does lead to a lot of misconnotations. So we're right in the sort of beginning of that sort of education, I guess, campaign at the moment um, to bring not only public awareness, but also awareness within the medical communities. So the first thing we do um, is put that local anesthesia in and that's the part that stings. So that's probably the bit that you will feel most. Um, I use a lot of local anesthesia. So when you've had biopsies in the past, you know, sometimes I don't even use local anesthesia with biopsies. I always do. And I usually use a couple of mils, one to two mils, you know. Um, in radiofrequency, it's not uncommon for me to use upwards of 20 mils of local anesthesia. So there's a lot more and that... The reason for that is twofold. One is obviously for analgesia, for pain relief, so that's important. But the other one is we use the local anesthesia to help lift important structures off the thyroid. So things like the carotid artery, the vagus nerve, even the trachea, although I tend to use um, 
uh, other solutions, not anesthesia, to lift things away from the trachea. But definitely for people with very large volume disease, you know, we need that anesthesia to cover a very wide area. Um, and so that means that, you know, that it takes a little while to infiltrate that anesthesia, usually in the order of sort of four or five minutes. It's not a terrible long time, but um, for a basic nodule, just a single nodule, you know, it takes, you know, two to three minutes. It's fairly quick. So once that's in, um, then we set up the equipment. We put a bit of um, betadine, iodine, or some other prep if the people are allergic to iodine on the neck, um, put some drapes around. We try and keep it sterile, as sterile as possible. Um, you'll have two electrodes put onto your thighs. Um, that's so that the current, the radio frequency current can be directed um, through the body um, correctly. Um, yeah, people with pacemakers or implants that with the bipolar electrode, we don't use those um, grounding pads so you won't have anything on your thighs but again most patients we don't use the bipolar electrode we use the monopolar and so you will have those grounding pads on and once the pads are on and the probe set up and the equipment's all on and we've prep the drape, you know, the neck and put the drapes on. Um, then we use the ultrasound to guide um, where we put the electrode initially. Um, I'll always start at the bottom of the nodule and work up. Um, so we usually start at the bottom innermost point of the nodule and then we work up, um, then we treat that level and then we work up at the next level and then we go to the next level and the next level, um, sort of moving from inside to outside. And so there's quite a lot of manipulation during the procedure. It's I call I call it a glorified biopsy, but it's really emphasis on the glorified because it's um, technically much more challenging than a biopsy. There's definitely a learning curve. During the ablation, you might hear some popping. It sounds like um, popcorn. It can be very loud. Um, I've had one lady who literally almost ran out of the room because I'd forgotten to warn her. It was completely my fault. So yes, popping is common and expected. A lot of people do feel um, some discomfort um, and it's not usually actually at the level of the thyroid, although it can be. Much more commonly, it's in the jaw, um, angle of the jaw or in the ear. Um, and that's very common, aching in the ear, aching in the jaw. If it's tolerable, we proceed and don't do, you know, and don't put more local anesthesia in. If it's not tolerable, we obviously stop and put more local anesthesia in. It tends to be when we're ablating near the outside perimeter of the thyroid nodule because that's where all of the sensory nerves run on that outer shell of the nodule. Um, when we're in the interior of the nodule, it's painless, there's no nerves. So they're the things to sort of expect during the procedure. We do get your neck back a little way. You know, I, I try not to extend it too much because you will be on the table for somewhere between 25 minutes and an hour, you know, depending on how many nodules we're treating and the size of the nodules. So, um, and there'll be a lot of talking going on over you during the procedure because, um, you know, whoever, you know, I would be constantly communicating with the person manning the radio frequency machine. Once um, we've gone from the, you know, ablated the whole nodule, we, you know, check make sure that the nodule doesn't have any bad blood vessels in it anymore, making sure that we've addressed all blood vessels. And actually we try and address those blood vessels right at the beginning of the procedure. So if there's some very obvious blood vessels, we actually try and go to them first, address them, get rid of the blood vessels, and then we ablate. And once um, it's finished and we're happy that we're done, we withdraw the electrode. It may have been that you may have, you know, we try and do it through one skin puncture when we can. Sometimes we need to do two for large volume disease or even more if we're treating both sides of the neck, but they're literally like little needle marks, as Jen, I'm sure you'd attest to, you know, and they heal up without any issue, without a scar, usually within a couple of days. So um, so we put some band-aids on those sites, ice pack on the neck, a pressure dressing on the neck for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then um, I usually watch people for around an hour after the procedure, just to make sure there's no swelling of the neck, that they feel okay, that everything's good. Um, and then, you know, the pressure dressing on the neck, the bandage can come off and then, um, then you can go home. At the end of the day, this is your thyroid, your nodule, and so you need to have an active part in deciding what treatment um, option you pursue. But I do think that um, ablation gives us access to a very uh, important and non-aggressive technique that we didn't have access to before. So I think it's it's an essential technique. I think it's going to become more and more popular for micro cancers, small thyroid cancers in favourable locations that um, would otherwise require, you know, half your thyroid to be removed. 
It won't be suitable for all small cancers, but definitely one to one and a half centimetre cancers that aren't at the back of the gland, that are sitting forward in the gland that can be easily ablated. I think we're going to see more and more movement in that area and perhaps in, um, in, in other areas, including recurrent thyroid cancers. Radio frequency, though, the ability to preserve hormone levels. So even if you ablate nodules on both sides of the thyroid in someone who otherwise would have needed a total thyroidectomy, um, they still maintain their hormone levels. Even people who've had prior thyroid surgery and you ablate the other side where they have, which is their only remaining thyroid tissue, they still don't need thyroid hormones. So it's really an amazing thing to me, this ability to preserve thyroid hormone. And the yes, radio frequency is less invasive. Yes, you don't get a neck scar. Yes, you're up and about the next day. You don't have much pain. So all these things are good. Um, but to me, the big one for radio frequency is the avoidance of the need for hormone.